Full of fury, and knowing what he now must do, Jules wastes no time in dumping out his maps and scanning over them for essential pieces of information he needed. Spying the bridge that would be the site of his quickly formulating plan, he finds an almost deranged smile crossing over his lips before he circles it with excitement. With the location confirmed, Jules lays out his minimal arsenal for examination and assembles a rifle that will end Kevin's life. I'm going to kill Kevin Conway. I knew what was going to happen. I knew what he was going to do, and I did nothing to stop it. I was too weak at the country club, but I don't have that excuse any longer. I'm no longer the doormat I used to be, and I should have used my strength to save those men, but the legacy of mercy that Marcus left behind stayed my hand. No more. I will not apologize for ridding the world of scum. Jules. Prepping and loading up an extensive medical kit and a duffel bag full of food, Jules begins to formulate an essential list of supplies for his coming journey, though there were far more important preparations to attend to. Rising early in the morning, with a singular focus in mind, Jules dons the stained and bloody parka he'd relied on before retrieving his new rifle. Knowing that his plan could hinge on the success of a single shot, Jules acknowledges his inexperience and dedicates his day to hunting down and eliminating targets. Picturing Kevin's shaved head as he dispatches distant undead, Jules briefly worries that he wouldn't have the determination to pull the trigger when it came time, but simply replaying the final moments of his radio broadcast gave him all the reinforcement he needed. Beginning to grow sloppy with his shots, as his shoulder throbs in pain, Jules realizes his day was done, and returns to Little Hope with only the intention of resting and going out once more in the morning. Wanting to conserve ammo for his main rifle, Jules switches over to another he had secured, before returning to a site where he'd already spilled oceans of blood.
Despite spending the majority of the day blasting rounds down range, Jules's confidence can only reach a certain level before the overwhelming fear of Kevin forces him to plateau. Accepting he had done all he could, Jules makes his way back home to enjoy a final evening of peace before the coming storm. Though I don't feel as confident as I would like with my aim, I think I have figured out a plan that will minimize the need to outgun my target. There is a bridge that he must cross if he leaves Valley Station heading south, and all I need to do is give him a reason to leave and hold my position there. One good shot is all it would take, then that monster will be gone for good. Tomorrow I'm leaving, and I might not return. Jules. Unable to sleep through the night, as the anxiety of what's to come stirs him awake, Jules spends potentially his last morning in little hope, with a heavy heart, but knows that he couldn't refuse the task he had been given. Locking up the gate and apologizing to Marcus a final time, Jules goes over the note he had left in his library, wondering who might stumble upon it if he didn't survive. If your name is Kevin, fuck you. If you're anyone else and you're reading this, then it means I didn't return. Feel free to stay here or take what you want. All I ask is that you don't fuss with my library since I just managed to get it organized. If you are incredibly kind, which I imagine you aren't if you've made it this far. Please leave my gnome Martin be. Finally, please respect the grave beside the fence line. I know you didn't know him, but a good man is buried there, and he deserves to rest in peace. Good luck, Jules. Setting off in the direction of West Point, Jules feels the full weight of what is to come as the pressure of the unknown begins to close in around him. The Jules from months ago would buckle at this point, feel the need to turn back, but that man who had been dominated by fear was gone, and only a truly hardened and wrathful survivor stood in his place.
Spotting somewhat freshly painted signs along his drive, Jules pays the distraction no mind before urging Marcus's truck ever onwards towards the sprawl of West Point. Finding the roads too dense to navigate, Jules begrudgingly turns his direction around to forge a longer but safer path. Finally reaching the eastern side of West Point, Jules is surprised to discover the cold buildings sparsely populated by the stubborn infected. While it was by no means clear, something had undoubtedly drawn the swarms to the other side of the city. Reaching the bridge he had planned to use to ambush Kevin, Jules' relief turns to agitation as he sees it congested with battered cars and burnt wrecks. Wondering how anyone could be making it across the river at this point, leads him to the nearby train track, before the faint signs of tire tracks confirms his suspicions. Scoping out and assessing the new location to adjust his plans, Jules goes through the due diligence of securing the area, before discovering a storage room that would serve perfectly as his base of operations. to give Kevin the chance to escape. Jules spends the final hours of light dragging crates and dumpsters out to the tracks, making sure that his victim would be boxed in once the trap was sprung. With all his preparations in place, and his will firmly cemented in the intent to murder Kevin, Jules slumps in the creaky plastic of the cold chair, and offers up the bait he knew Kevin couldn't resist. This message will repeat 600 hours, 1200 hours, and 1800 hours. Stay safe. You are not alone. He hello. My name is Jules Wade. I need help. I'm injured, and I'm starving. I just heard your broadcast in the news van I'm sheltering in. You need to come get me. I'm just outside Riverside, Kentucky. How soon can you come? Hello? Please. Please. I need help. I'm going to die. Please. Unable to truly sleep, Jules pulls himself from the depths of his own mind as the first signs of dawn creep beneath the nearby door. Double checking both his firearms and the harsh beam of his flashlight, he takes a final steadying breath before striking out into the chilly winter morning. Finding a small pine to tuck himself into at the end of the bridge, Jules peers through the shaky scope as he envisions the image of Kevin racing towards him. Unsure how he might arrive, Jules was at least certain of one thing. Kevin was coming, and even if he rumbled across the bridge in a tank, Jules wasn't going to back down.
beginning to wonder if he would have to wait for a second day as a steady rain begins to pick up. Jules stubbornly refuses to give up hope until the last slivers of light slithered over the horizon. Stop running, you fucking coward! Jules, you pathetic fuck! You think you can kill me? You couldn't even save yourself. I don't have to save me. I just have to fucking kill you! Come on! Come and get me! <coughs> you already killed one, Conway. You ain't killing another. <coughs> I'm not letting you get away with murdering my fucking brother! I'll skin you alive, you... Coming down off the intense rush of adrenaline that followed the killing of Jules's worst nightmare, the injured and ragged survivor finally began to feel the true pain mounting in his leg. Hissing and cursing as he drags himself into Kevin's car, Jules's bloody glove clumsily searches the interior before discovering a handful of dog tags clutched in his fist. Wanting nothing more than to shelter in the storage room he had slept in last night, Jules' heart sinks as he discovers the door shattered and his safety destroyed. Now realizing that this place would soon be swarming with undead following the chaotic gunfight, Jules swallows down the shooting pain in his right leg and loads his protesting body into Marcus's truck. Feeling his foot going numb against the pedal and his boot filling with blood, Jules peers through groggy eyes as he roars down the deserted road and lashes out desperately for a solution. Knowing he wasn't going to make it back to Little Hope in this state, the agonizing librarian searches his mind for another destination before the dull images of painted signs flash across his rattled brain. Fighting back the concern of the unknown, as he instinctively steers his ride in the direction of the mysterious symbols, Jules reluctantly admits that he had a slim amount of alternative options. 
Struggling up the gravel road and pulling into an overgrown community, Jules can easily recognize the lingering shadows of life despite his compromised state. Wobbling on his feet as he moves past the gate and into the yard, a spike of adrenaline serves to return some of Jules' faculties as he begins the agonizing process of clearing this mysterious home. Mostly hoping that he was safe, and deciding the generator would smoke out anyone still in hiding, Jules can no longer deny the excruciating hunk of metal lodged in his leg, and knows his ability to stay upright is quickly fading. Dragging himself into the upstairs bathroom in an attempt to limit his exposure, Jules finally strips off his bloody clothes to examine his soaked bandages before he plucks the tweezers from his first aid kit and goes to work. Fighting to stay awake while yanking his clothes over a hastily stitched wound, Jules stumbles his way across the hall and barricades himself in one of the bedrooms before the overwhelming urge to collapse overtakes him. Genuinely surprised to find himself alive in the morning, Jules stares at the dull walls that surround him before he forcefully urges his aching body from the comfort of the bed. Still uneasy about his surroundings and curious what he had stumbled across, Jules fights back the urge to stay hunkered down as he methodically scouts and checks the extent of the property. Discovering a half-rotten corpse hanging off the end of the dock, Jules is only faced with more questions as he tentatively assumes his security and heads back towards the main shelter to find answers.
beginning to piece together a story as he explores, Jules eventually comes across a pair of journals that he immediately dives into. It's been more than two weeks since the outbreak, and I feel as if I have found my own slice of heaven to escape to. Yesterday I set up a ham radio, and I'm going to begin broadcasting on it every morning to hopefully contact another survivor out there. Fuck who is ever in that goddamn helicopter, flapping about like some drunk bird of death. Power finally went out. Life just got a lot more difficult, and I can't exactly claim it was smooth sailing already. I'm filled with both joy and despair on this tremendous day. The pamphlet that I needed, the knowledge to get the power back on, it was so close for so long. I haven't felt the need to write in you for a while, which I'll call a victory for sure. Since my last entry, I've finally contacted someone on the radio. His name is Devin. He's just a kid. But at least it's someone to feel human with again. Writing in this always feels like defeat now. But something has happened to Devin, and I can't keep myself sane with all this silence. I don't know if I'll write in this journal again, or if I'll ever find my way back to this place. Devin's gone. The radio is trashed. I don't know what to do, but all I know is that I'm too much of a coward to check out of this fucking nightmare. Instead, I'm gonna show those undead fucks the true meaning of loss. If you're finding this journal after I'm gone, then I guess I should explain. I'm bitten. I can already feel the infection spreading, my skin tingling, my mind clouding. My last request, if you do find me dead, is to bury me in the grave I dug in the front yard. Please don't disturb the can of peaches. Uh, I know it's a silly request, but it, well, I guess it doesn't fucking mean anything anymore. I'm going to sleep, and I'm going to go find a nice place to die. Good luck, Jamie. Digesting all he had learned from the chronicles of Jamie Nichols, Jules finds himself drying off by the fire as he pours over the scribbled records once more. Some aspect of hearing another survivor's struggles resonated with Jules more than any published book could ever dream to achieve, and that seed of emotion left Jules no choice in respecting Jamie's final wishes. Cursing at his bum leg and dousing the fires of pain with more pills, Jules marches back out towards the dock with the same determination that had gotten him this far.
honoring the grave with the addition of the worn helmet and vest Jules had found by the front door. The tired but content survivor finally lets his guard down and lets the evening pass in the comfort of Jamie's home. Knowing he had to return to Little Hope sooner rather than later, Jules takes the time to lay out Jamie's journals, along with his own note, before he begins to collect supplies from around the house. My name is Jules Wade. I came across this place on my way back home and sheltered here for a couple days. To anyone else who stumbles across what remains, I hope you take full advantage of the security provided by this place. I left plenty of supplies for anyone in need, and honored the request of the previous occupant. Good luck. Be safe. Jules. Allowing himself one last afternoon of relaxation in his temporary home, Jules finds himself reflecting on all the various events and people that brought him to this strange place. There was now some sense of closure following the death of Kevin that Jules hadn't fully expected. Whether or not Jules had joined the ranks of being a monster, he couldn't deny that his soul felt lighter, his prospects seemed brighter, and for the first time since this nightmare had began, he felt hopeful for the future. Knowing that it was time to depart the shelter he had found along the river, Jules spends the morning gathering his things and taking one last look at the home of a fellow survivor before he sets his sight back in the direction of home. Pulling once more into the garage he had erected himself, Jules greets Little Hope with renewed appreciation as the evidence of his struggle and journey sprawled out all around him. This is Jules Wade hailing NNR. Kevin Conway is dead. The monster that killed your men is gone. But I know that does nothing to bring them back. You're right. That does mean nothing. Especially since you're trying to lure us into another trap. I don't blame you for thinking so. But I assure you my reason for reaching out is simply to help provide closure for those you lost. I have their dog tags. Daniel Burns... Trenton Burke and Cameron R. something. I'm sorry, the last one is damaged. Reed. Cameron Reed. 
I can't offer you anything unless you come to us and surrender yourself. Otherwise, I think our business is at an end. I understand, and I don't want anything from you. Perhaps I'll consider making my way to you once spring comes and my leg heals, though I wouldn't mind hearing another voice from time to time. I can't stop you from broadcasting on this frequency. I'll take that. Again, I'm sorry. Your men weren't the only victims of Kevin. Hopefully they're the last. It's done. Kevin's dead. I know the full weight of his death hasn't quite worked its way through my soul, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel relieved overall, though taking someone else's life was never something I thought I'd be capable of. There is no doubt in my mind that Kevin was a deserving target. It surprises me little that the NNR don't trust me, but perhaps with consistent communication and transparency, they'll come to accept my news as fact if for no other reason than to let them know that their dead have been avenged. To their credit, they did make the offer of inviting me in if I made the trip up to Wisconsin, but I can't say that I'm all that enthused to leave little hope for such a reluctant ally. For now, I simply hope that the peace I have achieved will last, and the final days of winter will pass by without further incident. It'll be as if the world is born anew when spring comes witnessing life blooming all around me once more. That would be nice. I'll make sure to document the feeling when the day comes. For now, I think I'm going to spend a few days reading, trapping birds, and conversating with my new friends. Hopefully Martin doesn't get jealous. Jules. Jules.